Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 58 of Interstellar Quest, and Jebediah Kerman is commanding the unnumbered descendant of Zardoz back through Kerbin's atmosphere, hopefully to a safe landing at the Kerbal spaceport. Now you'll notice that it is rather unstable. In fact, he seems to be having some trouble controlling it. Well, as it turns out, the landing didn't go quite as planned. But let's see what happened to uh, old or young me. Okay, so we're just keeping this extra, extra careful. Look at the moon and Minmus behind us there. That's where, of course, uh, one of our, our previous payload is going. Just traveling at 1.9 kilometers per second almost slowing down ever so carefully but trying to keep my altitude high enough look at the heating on the underside of that spacecraft and I'm just trying to it's just trying to keep the roll on here oh 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 come on roll back roll back roll back roll back roll back come on keep this thing str oh it's getting worse it's getting worse not good Jebediah oh roll the other way Jebediah Jebediah you know you can do it Keep this thing under control, and you know what? Okay, so we're still going at 1.7 kilometers per second. Unless I can perform a braking maneuver, I'm going to overshoot. But I don't dare because ah, no, 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 we're pancaking, we're pancaking. Okay, uh, well, okay, that's great. Um, I have no control here. I have no control. Uh, at least I can point the thing upwards, but I am rapidly losing velocity here. Uh, good news is that I'm not going to overshoot the space center anymore. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing this is a center of mass issue, so I'm going to start pumping fuel forwards. That's There's a lot of fuel in those rear tanks. Uh, if you remember, I had to adjust this thing so it flew better early on. We'll try and fire the rocket motors as well to get some control authority back. That's right. Oh, look. Look at that. We're going to get some control back here. 500 meters per second. And uh, we're actually going to be able to fly this thing again. Just look. I only pumped a little amount of fuel forwards, but no, 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 no. Come on. Come on. Get down there. Yes. Okay. Look at that, we actually have control of this thing again, and all I had to do was pump a little bit of fuel forwards. Now hopefully, if I can just keep the control, hopefully we can make it down to the to the uh, space center. It's really weird how we're descending through the cloud and I have it's much, much harder to figure out where things are. Even although I can see everything. Oh, and, and, and we're starting to lose control again. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, okay, so we switched to saber mode, and I'm just going to try and keep the nose up. I guess I'm just going to pump more fuel forwards. Yeah, oh, wow, yeah, we're totally flipping backwards on this. We are still unstable. I'm not sure how... I'm not sure how that happened. Okay, so note to future self. Oh, oh, wow. Wait, we're... we're our engines are popping. Come on. Okay, so note to future self. Next time I fly this thing and I'm descending, make sure I've pumped the fuel forwards. I kind of suspected that might be the case, but uh, I didn't really think about it before descending. Could be worse. Could be worse. Okay, at least and I've got vertical speed again. We are not going to crash this thing. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Okay. We're still moving about over Mach 1, and we are not, oh, we're not able to do this without turning. We're just continuously deflected away from our velocity vector by almost 90 degrees. I'm just going to, as long as I can keep the nose up, we can, as long as I can keep the nose up, I can stop crashing. So the trick is just to get enough fuel forwards that the thing will actually fly and be stable while I turn it. Okay, so I'm now deflected the other direction, and I think we're actually able to turn it. Okay, we are doing pretty well. We are switched to surface mode. 
and I think I have enough control authority now to actually land this thing. Jebediah Kerman showing the expert, showing the experts how to do things, eh? I tell you, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I did not expect that necessarily to happen. Okay, so that feels like it's going to get me home. Now it's just a case of pointing yourself towards the runway, keeping the fuel forward. Not, don't want to make it too nose heavy. Looks like I've gone quite a way south, but it's really hard to tell through these clouds. We should get one of those fancy radar instrument landing systems, right? To be honest, I feel that all those heads up display markers are uh, kind of cheaty. Oh, silly old me. They would be cheating if you lived in a world without radar and other navigation technologies. We can calculate the orbits of spacecraft in deep space, but we should probably have some sort of instrument landing system or whatever to at least help me tr through these clouds. Although the clouds aren't in the base game. But back to old me. Okay, so we're now getting kind of close, and to avoid the previous problems, let's make sure we put the underground undercarriage down extra early. We have... this should be flying a whole lot better. The only thing is, I think I might have messed up on the fuel balance, because it seems to want to pull to the left every time I pull up. Every time I pull up, I get some sort of phantom yaw that it... Oh, yeah, we get a phantom yaw when we're not pausing the game every time it loads something. Yeah, so... Oh man, this is going to be hard. So it's almost... It's like there's a crosswind, almost. I mean, it's not a crosswind, it's just I pull back and for some reason my aircraft is yawing to the left. Not what I want. Okay, so if I can just keep it pointed... This is totally like landing in the wind, you know, the, the aircraft wants... Well, it's not that the aircraft wants to turn, it's that you end up kind of pointing sideways down the runway and then turning just as you land, and I got it down. I should know by now never to underestimate the skills of Jebediah Kerman. It was not the easiest landing I've ever done, but uh, we managed to put it down safely and we shall take that data and make a better spacecraft, and no doubt make sure we you know, uh, pump the fuel forwards next time. But anyway, let's take a look at the Outland, which is out there heading towards a rendezvous with the moon. It's going to swing by at about 20-something kilometers. We want to use the chemical uh, liquid propellant engine to put ourselves into orbit, and then we're going to use the actual solid rocket motor, or sorry, not the solid rocket motor, but the aluminium hybrid rocket motor, to actually land us on the surface. But we're going to do something rather special first before we uh, finish this insertion. So now what I'm going to do, now that we've slowed down to bring my, my Apple apps down below a thousand kilometers, is I'm going to point my spacecraft away from the surface. We're still going towards it. We're, our periaps is about 24.5 kilometers. And I... I'm just going to more or less fire this away from the surface, right? So it's like I'm uh, accelerating away from the surface as quickly as the engine will allow me. You can see that? Now, what you'll notice is that my periaps is now moving backwards away from me because it's as if I've come from a lower point in my orbit. So my periaps is, as we're doing this, moving closer and closer to the moon. Why would I want to do this? Ah, well, you'll find out in a little while. Just uh, bringing that, the periaps of my orbit down a little, and I think I actually need to kind of burn retrograde a little because my uh, Apple apps is rising too much. I don't want it to get too high because we kind of do need to kill our velocity. And the periaps is about one. Okay, so that's it. Now that is on an orbit which will collide with the moon. So it is time to ditch this stage which we use to bring us into moonar orbit. And now we can switch over to this newfangled piece of technology, an aluminium liquid oxygen engine which can be refueled using rocks from the moonar surface, which allows us to, well, essentially it allows us to perform in situ resource utilization, ISRU. That's why the refinery is an ISRU refinery, if you hadn't figured out. Anyway, we're going to do a proper uh, descent and landing here. I kind of want to do it on the day side, and that's the only problem. We're going to kind of fly across the night side. And then, 
that will bring us the other thing I want to do is make sure that I'm at least somewhat on the side of uh, I want to be able to see Corbin because we want to come around and establish good communications and everything so we fly over the surface at some speed time accelerating our way across the pockmarked Munner landscape magnificent desolation as they say and we start firing our engine just a little to flatten our our orbit just a bit and we're going to make sure that we're going to land on the illuminated side in sight of Kerbin. and there goes the proper landing maneuver this thing as i said looks more or less like a regular solid rocket booster but it is throttleable because it is a hybrid rocket. Hybrid rockets, if you know, if you remember, they use liquid fuel and a solid fuel, or liquid and solids in the same engine. It generally, it's a case of a liquid oxidizer and a solid propellant, and you basically pump the oxidizer through and it burns, helps burn everything. Collecting some data on the way down, admiring Kerbin there hanging low on the horizon. All sorts of science being done on the way down, but none of it is actually valuable right now because we've actually collected most of this already on previous voyages to the moon. The real bounty of science will arrive once I start collecting data on the surface. And we're getting down to about 30 meters. That's pretty close. We're just going to take this ever so carefully down because this is the first time we've landed it. It is rather top heavy. And if the, if the landscape is sloping, you kind of want to make sure that it is sloping along the vehicle's long axis. I do not want this thing to fall over when I land it. That would be really, really embarrassing. And contact! Engine's off. Oh, that's rather beautiful. We've settled on the surface. And first thing we're going to do is activate our power receiver, which is going to be collecting in the power for our ISRU refinery. We're going to start mining alumina, alumina being, of course, silicon dioxide, which uh, is also known, incidentally, as a, it's the same material that's used to make sapphire, right? A crystalline aluminium oxide is sapphire. But it's actually very hard to grow crystals, you know, of, of that size. You tend to get it as more like a dust or a sand. Anyway, for a moment, one of the materials reflects something black on the moon's surface. Uh-oh. The mystery goo says it seems to have gotten dirty. Did anyone bring a duster? Because, of course, dusting goo makes complete sense. Now, we have the seismic accelerometer, which is picking up distant impacts on the surface, reflecting along the interior of the moon. That sounds fascinating. We can collect, uh, what else? Well, it appears we have more than one of these things. We have a thermometer. It can't seem to make up its mind whether it's hot or cold here. Now, Interstellar Mod affords us a new way of doing science now. We can turn these seismometers to uh, record seismic events. And now, remember that booster that I uh, ejected on a collision course with the moon? Well, it's going to collide with the moon, and it will provide a big impact event. It will make a lot of noise. The sound will resonate through the moon. It will pass through its various core layers, and hopefully... When it is picked up by the seismometers, they will be able to reconstruct some scientific data about the interior of the body we're studying. So the so it descends towards the surface, surely doomed! Okay, that didn't work. Well, I was going to say it's surely doomed, but apparently a bit survived. Let's go and take a look at the, at the base to see if that impact gave it any information. Okay, collect impact data, go on. No data. Nope, nope. Okay, this is broken. That's great. Uh, brought all this stuff up here and none of it actually works. Collect impact data, nope, doesn't work. Neither of the seismometers are giving me any data. Collect impact, nope, nope, just to be sure. Hmm. Perhaps the spacecraft actually needs to be destroyed for the seismometer events to work. Let's try that again with the decoupler as the impactor. It looks like it's going to land right in this crater. That's a hole in two, because technically the first one was... Never mind. And... 
Impact! Boo! Oh, impact recorded. Site report can now be accessed from one of your accelerometers deployed on this body. That is brilliant. And there it is, the crater in which we landed and made a nice little puff of smoke. Now let's go and take a look at those seismometers to collect that sweet, sweet, sweet impact science. Oh, there's the pl there's Kerbin in the background there looking rather sweet. Okay, collect impact data. Yes! 151 science. Outland debris impacted the moon, producing seismic activity. From this data, information on the structure of the moon's crust can be obtained. And can we get more data there? No, apparently all the seismometers do the same thing. Okay, so we've collected enough uh, aluminium and enough oxygen. We are ready to go flying to another location. So engine is fired up once again and we start moving sideways. So yeah, the, the moon's crust contains a lot of silicon dioxide and aluminium oxide. And uh, yeah, the, the way you would have to process this is you would have to kind of separate them into liquids and then try electrolyzing the aluminium oxide to pull off oxygen and aluminium. And I was saying, yeah, that aluminium oxide, when you crystallize it properly, it becomes sapphire or emerald or uh, ruby. The colors actually come from impurities in it. But if you have no impurities, you get essentially a white, perfect crystal. And they're now starting to use... Uh, sapphire. They call it sapphire glass, essentially. They're starting to use it in things like camera lenses and smartphone displays because it's so scratch resistant. My phone, my iPhone uh, 5S, the fingerprint sensor has a sapphire window on it and so does the camera lens. So it's a pretty awesome technology, but we can use it to power this spacecraft as well just by melting it down and running megawatts of electricity through it. And one more landing in a new biome lets us go and collect new data. And touchdown, ever so gently. Ever so gently, touchdown. More data to collect. But before I start dedicating my time to science, I should turn on the power supply and start running this refinery again. Electrolyze aluminium and mine alumina. There we go, we got all the stuff going on here. Water extractor, all that, yeah, we don't need any of that stuff. Nope, we are, we are now refueling this spacecraft once again. It will take a while during which we can collect sites from this new location. We have two crew, of course, in the lab at this time. According to Sidzi Kerman, the moon looks like a really big rock. Also, the reading, the seismic readings are solid, but they would be better if they could, we can do them in the canyon. Guess where I'm going to take this spacecraft next. Okay, so I'm going to store the experiments and head and take a look at the surface. There we go. It's a bit of a drop. Ah, but it's all in the line of his work, day's job or whatever. There we go. Tiny flecks of purple flesh dot the mineral deposits here. The texture of the crater looks quite puckered. Is this evidence that this was once the home of the legendary Kraken? The Kraken is no legend. I have seen the Kraken. You notice weird rocks. Okay, great. Um, actually, one thing we didn't do is uh, we never planted a flag at the previous location, did we? Oh, yep, yeah, and we've got more data coming in from the lab. The lab is still working in the background as I'm jaunting around the moon here. Let's put out a flag to commemorate the occasion, huh? With our yellow circles and stuff. Um, I uh, don't remember what biome I'm in, so I'm just going to say uh, this is the second site that we visited. <laughs> I probably should have gone and visited the, or probably should have put a flag at the first site instead. But uh, this will do. We can maybe place flags everywhere we go from now on. I'm not sure we can find our original site. But yes, Sidzi Kerman is still doing the piloting. Now, we collected some awesome seismic data from the that first probe. Well, it turns out we have some spent space hardware sitting in orbit. Do you remember this spacecraft that was doing the Keithane scan, which uh, ultimately we decided that we didn't care about Keithane? Uh, it also suffered from some thermal uh, properties, problems. So I figured, let's uh, just deorbit this thing onto the moon so that we can collect some sweet, sweet science. 
And there it is, falling towards the surface. It's going to hit at a much more shallow angle, but it will be no less destructive for this, this spacecraft. This will be its last mission. This is one of the earliest things I put in orbit around the moon. And finally I'm clearing up the space around it. It has but a moment to uh, consult its data banks and figure out how it's going to be in the afterlife. And impact recorded. Science can now be accessed from one of your... Oh, and there's another piece. Oh, the solar panel continued to fly through space. That is one tough solar panel. In fact, it is now moving faster than the original spacecraft. Well, we'll find out what happens to it in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.